The phone conversation between fantasy veterans Bob Harris and Matt Waldman is a quick and dirty rundown of players, units, or teams from Sunday's games. Feel it or fuck it is our instant verdict on the fantasy value of a player situation, not the ability, effort, or character of the player. This is just how two old-timers in this industry talk when they got a lot of cover in a little time. Good morning, kind of, sort of, not really. It's week one, nothing good about it. James Robinson. I'm feeling it. They've been promising us this all along. They've been foreshadowing it. I think it's all right. his Achilles was only partially torn. Maybe there's a difference. Yeah, I'm feeling it. I I liked what he I liked what he showed in the run game. I I think that there was enough acceleration. The change of direction looked smooth. Didn't look like he was favoring anything notably. Um, so that's a that's a good plus right there. And he actually caught the ball in the red zone. Um, Allen Robinson. Um, I'm looking to trade for him today. Like, I, I think the Rams know what zone coverage looks like. I'm not sure the <laughs> excuses they used after that game uh, hold up. What they need to figure out is the offensive line. That's the bigger concern. If they can't figure that out, fuck everybody there. Yeah, I would agree with that. The offensive line, I mean, Note Boom just got schooled by Von Miller, and he looked like someone who got stage fright the moment Von he saw what it's like to deal with Von Miller. Um, overthought everything. But when you look at Allen Robinson, I think part of it, too, is that Matthew Stafford understands – um, where he wants to go with certain high low looks, and that the guy who's he's going to go with is going to be away from the the charted progression against the zone coverage. It's going to be the guy that he knows he can get the ball to, and he's, he has the best rapport with. And Matthew Stafford has seen zone before. He knows how this works. Yes, exactly, and he knows how to go. I know what they teach you on the blackboard, kids. But this is what I do, and this is what a lot of good quarterbacks do. They find the, the best player. The Bills didn't blitz one time in that game. Zero they, blitzes. They sent in four. That game. They sent they, four. I mean, Von Miller put on a clinic, and it wasn't even just Von Miller. It was that middle. It was the middle too. Yeah, to, totally. Got a pass that. block. Travis Etienne. <sighs> I'm gonna say fuck it because I I know that I know that he got his utilization targets from old Dwayne McFarlane, our buddy, but you know that the utilization percentages were good, but I just don't think he's that good of a player. And I know that we saw with, you know, Deandre Swift in the past that there was a, there was a difference and he was, I didn't think he was a great football player. So maybe Travis Etienne follows in that, but I think James Robinson is too good. I think that, that Etienne has more flaws than what DeAndre Swift had. So you, when you tip those scales, I also think there's better receivers in Jacksonville. So you put all that together, and there's not as much of a need to just dump the ball down to Travis Etienne as much. So I'm not there with him. How about you? Urban Meyer might have had one thing right. He's like a peripheral piece, right? Uh, he just he didn't look good on the plays that I saw. I'm, I'm moving past him. I'm, I'm glad I got all the Robinson shares I did so starting late in the uh, summer because, man, the reports were good, and now the uh, outcome is good. Yeah. How about Chase Edmonds? Um, I'm, I'm feeling it a little bit. I think, you know, like, like the results weren't as great as they need to be, but the workload was fine, and, I, you know, and most of it wasn't. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling it too, and I think there's I think there's room for Mostert to get better. Um, he got some he got some uh, closeout plays that look pretty good. They used him in the passing game a little bit, but yeah, the volume was really there for Edmonds, and Edmonds just looks so good in the PPR setting as a as a guy that they can use to pick on linebackers on a regular basis. And he ran decently. Um, it's just a matter of what this oh, two, offense. Two yards of carry isn't decently, young man. Stop that. Yeah, well, okay. I'm, you know what? Two yards of carry doesn't mean anything to me. What I saw on the tape looked decent. Um, you know, in terms of decision making, burst, his ability to find the right crease. The matter is, is what he also played the New England Patriots, and the one thing that they still do pretty good is stop the run, and they've always been pretty good at stopping the run. Those guys are still in play. Um, the problem was, is that. You know, that was pretty much all that was going on for the New England Patriots in a good way. And and so when I look at this, I'll, I, I'm will i still feeling Chase Edmonds as a, as a possibility there. How about Michael Thomas? Feeling it. Feeling it. Um, <laughs> the, the route participation was great. Uh, McFarlane has that up on his Twitter feed. Check it out. But in addition, 
just this adds to every damn thing I heard all off season long. Uh, the drum beat, you know, and, and we can say that there are beat writers that get invested in their own narratives. And this was every single beat writer, every single one that was pumping a positive note on this guy. And, and, you know, they do that because they want to look smart at the end of the, at the end of the progression. Right. And so, you know, and that's all we have to go on is what people on the ground are seeing. What they saw was very positive. What I saw yesterday was very positive. Remember Jay Glazer, the Gla- Jay Glazer told us he was only going to play 20, 30 snaps. So, uh, obviously, he's exceeded everyone's expectations. I feel like a win. I'm claiming it now. Victory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was the guy I recommended for everybody is the one guy you take a real chance on in the first five rounds of your draft. And when you, you know, he, he was pressing a little bit early on. He looked like he was trying a little bit too hard and being a little too aggressive and slipping and sliding in places, trying to make releases. And, of course, the Falcons played a lot of press man early and rushed the passer and got to Winston pretty much at the top of his drops throughout the first half. But Dean Pease, offensive coordinator, decided at the end, towards the end of that game that they were going to play a little less man-to-man. Now, even before when, the, when Jameis Winston was basically, you know, taking apart this zone defense in the waning minutes of this game for the comeback. Before that, Michael Thomas was winning, and he was winning against A.J. AJ Terrell one-on-one. So that probably had a little bit to do with it, too, is that if Michael Thomas was heating up to win one-on-one or they were finding ways to beat A.J. Terrell with some schemed looks with him, that it was going to work out. And, yeah, when you look at what he was able to do at the end of the game, smooth, confident he and Winston started to build that correction uh, connection totally feeling it how about Cordero Patterson feeling it look the mystery we our mind our minds you know we suck all the most horrible thoughts into a vacuum right and the vacuum we had this summer was we didn't see any Cordero Patterson all we heard were some tidbits he's going to play a little more receiver he's going to do this or that all these things not going to duplicate last year's role no yes he's exactly going to duplicate last year's role Damian Williams got hurt early in this game. Granted, Tyler Algier was inactive. Uh, you know, and, and so maybe this was a little bit of an outlier, but really, do you think that is? It's too bad Arthur Smith uh, can't win games because he's a great offensive mind who needs to be uh, running, a, running a team. But I, I, you know, I don't know how sustainable that is. But for right now, totally feeling Cordero Patterson. The fact that they, are, they were in a close game and ahead, actually the fact that they were well ahead with Marcus Mariota, and they were trying to do their damnedest to not put the ball in his hands to make um, decisions that Matt Ryan would be allowed to make. Um, tells you a lot. Cordero Patterson, I'm totally feeling him. I mean, he's like a he's like a 1970s running back. He actually, if you put him and Derrick Henry side by side and actually gave him a jersey that was like a single digit jersey, you might not you might look and go, you know, he stacks up pretty darn well when he gets off the bus. This is a 230. They say, you know, over and over again, people football players try to tell you when Jonathan Bill was like, this is a 230, 240 pound running back, not a former wide receiver catching fade routes at Tennessee. And he runs like that. Pete Warner may have had a good game, but he trucked Pete Warner linebacker for the Saints a number of times. The one thing they do know how to do is run gap plays with him. He does that at a high level. Totally impressed with him. Recommended him before. Feeling that all day long. Kyle Pitts? I, fuck it, man. No. And it has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with Pitts' talent. It has everything to do with that that Marcus Mariota, I ju- they're gonna feed him. They're gonna feed him, but it's gonna be like the junior Delaney Walker plan. And to me, it's not worth the the value that you had to sink in to get him. So, I mean, if you've got him, you're going to have to ride it out, but I'm not going to be trading for him. And if I can, after a good game or two, I might be trying to trade him away at, at, at the highest value that I can get and pick up, maybe take my chances on a, on a, on a tight end that either I've got, you know, later on, or I get later on, you know, as the season goes on, there's a couple that I would keep in mind. That's for sure. But what about you? What he said, uh, mostly. Uh, like, I think at the end of the season, the numbers are going to be there, but just, uh, you know, how you get there is not going to be as uh, as impressive as we thought because it's just, again, you know, everything you said is totally correct. Just uh, see it in the middle of the road passing attack. 
All right, we got to revisit this guy because I almost said fuck it on him, but I I got to be honest, I got I got swayed a little bit. David and Joku. Uh, I'm still feeling it. I'm just not feeling this offense, right? I mean, you know, I'm still playing the investment. I'm playing their their faith in him, but like this entire offense looks like a disaster. Fuck it. Yeah, I, listen, they can run the ball. They 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 can absolutely run yeah, the ball. Yeah, I should have said pass to get that. Yeah, but that's okay. Run. But I knew what you meant. I knew what you meant, but like, yeah, without Deshaun Watson, I mean, Jacoby Brissett holds onto the ball a little bit too long, and it's it's more so because his feet are so slow. He's got that loping Jameis Winston thing before Jameis Winston worked with who? Jay Glazier and a bunch of other QB trainers to speed up a little bit. But Njoku was wide open on some plays, but they're long developing plays that just don't mesh well with what Jacoby Brissett doesn't do. And then they had to keep him in the block on top of that. I, I look at this and this, this team is run the ball down your throat or lose the game. And, and you can, they may be doing a lot of both um, until Deshaun Watson comes back or even after Deshaun Watson comes back for a little bit on top of that. So yeah, fuck that. How about uh Mac Jones? Who? This offense is <laughs> Mac Jones. <laughs> This offense is dead to me. Fuck them. Uh, right? Like the three-headed now backfield, Ty Montgomery back in the mix. Uh, there's going to be a receiver of the week uh, similar to the running back of the week. And Mac Jones is going to come up a little short. Like, you know, I mean, he, he's going to be playing, assuming the back is okay. And so he's fine. It's like a emergency second quarterback in super flex leagues, et cetera. But beyond that, there's not a, nothing exciting here. And, uh, you know, I'd like to blame Matt Patricia or Joe Judge or Bill Belichick or whatever. Just whatever you blame, the offense is not working yet. It looks like it's going to be a bit of a process. Yeah, I'll say this. It, it really came down to three plays, and three and three of those plays were were basically blown assignments by the offensive line that resulted in sacks, sack fumble, a sack fumble, and I believe a score after that. Um, so, you know, they could fix this well enough that Mac Jones could be a low-end quarterback <clears throat> one for you down the line. But in but until they do, and considering how it looked, I mean, even Devon, Devontae Parker got locked up by Xavier Howard. You could insert probably all but five to seven receivers in the NFL where you could put their name in the place of him when it comes to a guy like Xavier Howard. So I think there's a little more hope, but I would say based on where he was being drafted, based on what's going on with this line, yeah, fuck that. Yeah, Devin DuVernay, flavor of the week. Oh, I'm, he's been flavor of the summer for me, feeling that. I know that relative to his value, the fact that they're targeting him on vertical routes against tight coverage and he was Lamar Jackson was hitting them this year, I'm feeling that it's going to be a low target share. You're not using them in two wide receiver leagues. I understand that. Are you using them in four wide receiver leagues where he's a flex? You could be. And I think he's worthwhile at the end of your bench if you're in a roster with at least 20, um, 20 participants on your team. Uh, Devin Duvernay, the new Isaiah Likely. Get used to it, kids. <laughs> like that. O.J. Howard. Uh, fuck that. I mean, we got a three, we got a three way split. I, it was exciting. People are going to chase it and I'm going to watch them chase and kind of giggle silently to myself. You know, I don't know. You know, I, I want to say that, you know, the target share was low again, three way splits at tight end don't work for anybody. That's true. But I'll say this three way splits at tight end don't work for anybody. But the context is, is that if that three way split begins with a player who's been in camp for all of about three days and hasn't had any rapport with the, with the quarterback, and they they begged him to come onto that team, and he cu catches two touchdowns in that three way split with advantageous looks that seem to fit what their offense does, and and you know they may it depends on what kind of league if you're in like if if I'm in a if I'm in a big league like you and I are in where you know I've got a lot of money to blow. I'm going to chase O.J. Howard. I'm feeling that, even though I know from my scouting, I said he's the type of guy that will basically, you're going to say, oh, fuck me for actually doing this. But I'll take my chance on O.J. Howard just because I think that I'll be able to get him cheap I love enough. the overly enthusiastic Matt Waldman. We need more of this. Amari Cooper. <laughs> 
ah, fuck that. <laughs> and it's not because that of him. It, I, he, he does the beautiful work with releases and routes. But when you watch Jacoby Brissett throw moon balls or throw it late or do the things that he did, Amari Cooper's A, either going to get hurt, not going to have enough accurate targets, or he's going to lead the league in drawing pass interference penalties from opposing defenders. Um, but none of those things are going to reward you in the fantasy column. Uh, exactly correct, sir. Uh, but I wanted to get the one that I'm very excited about now. How much Richie James will you be stashing right away? Richie James, go, Matt. Yeah, I'm taking it. I've, lo- I've always loved Richie James. Yeah. This and- is a Kadarius Tony take, right? I mean, Kadarius Tony played seven seven snaps. This is all. This is all about the failure of Kadarius Tony. He- more so than the success of Richie James, you just love Richie James, so you did it backwards. He, he peed in he peed in 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 the oatmeal of Brian Dable or something. Richie, uh, not Richie James, but Kadarius Tony, because when you watch him, he's still he's obviously the one of the most talented wide receivers on. The, I think he's the most talented wide receiver on the team. He flashed it when he was on the field. So I don't know what he did. But obviously, he was always known for not having a mature, you know, that maturity was a streak for him, not necessarily a stable thermostat type of situation for him. So that's a problem. But Richie James made some tough catches, got open, got targeted the most out of the receivers, um, can run after the catch. I think it's only going to get better for him in terms of opportunity, especially with Wandale Robinson out. And if it doesn't, I mean, seriously, you're getting them off the waiver wire. So take the chance while you can get them as long as it's in a league where it's a, a deeper league. You know, don't say, should I drop Allen Robinson for Richie James? And I know I'm going to get that question. I know you're going to get that question. The answer is fuck no. But, don't do that. but you know, are you going to are you going to drop Garrett Wilson for Richie James? You might. You know, considering this Jets offense and, you know, you're going to drop, you know, are, are you going to drop players, A.J. Green for Richie James? You might, you know, based on based on those types of factors. But, you no, know, don't drop your guy that you drafted within the first time, 10 rounds of your draft for Richie James. Saquon hmm. Barkley. All right, me a couple time. So I railed against people who were drafting him as a top 10. You know, he moved up the ADP so fast, and I felt like we were maybe pinning too many hopes on Brian Dable being a, an instant cure to an offense that was so bad last year. And I guess that was where I was stuck on. And also hadn't seen the explosive Saquon Barkley uh, last couple of years. I saw him yesterday. Um so kind of feeling it. Uh, don't have any of it because I thought the price was too high. Don't think he's going to average nine yards of carry over the course of the year. Uh, but uh, looks pretty damn good. And so uh, me a couple. Yeah, I'm with you. But you know what? I'm not apologizing for the fact that the dude looked slow last year, that he didn't want to take on contact. He wanted to try and make a move that he couldn't make in every situation. Heck, I scouted him for five Five, I scouted five games of his last year, and it just was not looking. It didn't look that good. So, listen, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with having to change my mind on him because very rarely I like to rant against people. When I hear people say, oh, he just looks that much faster, I go, you don't even know what you're looking at, dude. I watch these guys, <laughs> and if I can't tell, I know you can't tell unless there's just a part of my brain where the difference in – you know, two miles per hour is, I just can't see, you know, and somehow everyone else can. But if that's the case, I sure as shit am in the wrong living <laughs> doing what I do. But I'll say this about Saquon Barkley. I did notice it this year. It is that notable. And he's running hard this year. The, the last play, the, the two-point conversion was my favorite play. It was the shortest run he had probably that was a successful run. But the pad level, the short area change of direction, the it, it was all there. And there was a lot more on display that was easier to even see, um, you know, especially with some of the, the holes that the Giants were opening on the Titans defense, which might be a statement about the Titans defense a little more yeah. than this Giants offense. But they're running a lot more gap plays. And it seems like the whole league is running more gap plays. And it's not because of Debo Samuel. I heard that. Apologies to some of my readers who said that, but it's it's because of the fact that I think that they're understanding that if you keep things simple for a lot of these running backs, not every running back needs to run zone. 
Sometimes it's about, look, dude, don't think, just hit the gas. And that's what, and with Saquon Barkley, yeah, that's gas. for sure. And by the way, Brian Dable, uh, just the sideline demeanor was great. Liked him going after Daniel Jones, liked him going back and <clears throat> asking Daniel Jones to do things after going after him on the sidelines. Just, uh, uh, I like I liked the direction it's going. Matt, we need the micro dose real quick here before we get into one. Aaron Rodgers, feel him or fuck him. <laughs> Totally fuck that offense, man. Two tackles out. That's not even just the tackles that are out. So Aaron Rodgers, you're always going to feel as a quarterback. D massive respect for him as a quarterback. The problem that I have is that it's just, this was exactly what we were talking about with Romeo Dubs, I think, last week. Or I was talking somewhere last week. I'm so tired, I don't know where I am. But, you know, and I'll figure it out sometime this morning. No, you, I, won't. you know, Yeah, I probably won't, but I'll type Drink something. more spinach. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Or kale. But the, you know. Both. The, yeah, or both. Exactly. And some ginger on top of that. But I'm feeling ginger. But the, uh, mm, I'm not feeling. Yeah, there you go. But I'm not feeling. Well, ginger's a little high, high maintenance for me, but that's okay. <laughs> but uh, Saquon Barkley. No, Aaron Rodgers. See, now I don't even know where I am. Aaron Rodgers, when you look at this, he his receivers don't know where they are. And that's the problem. Is that he at the end in the beginning of the season, oh, Romeo Dubs is waking while plays. Romeo Dubs, every every and then by the end of the season, in the preseason, he's like, These receivers aren't going to get much playing time if they keep making mistakes. And the mistakes are what we saw on the field, which was you know, Dubs running the wrong route early, you know, late in the second in the second quarter. And just you know, like Christian Watson whipping Patrick Peterson. I can just imagine a story he tells like 15 years from now. What was your what was your first memory of the NFL? He goes, <laughs> I lined up against Patrick Peterson, one of the great man-to-man -man cornerbacks of his generation, and I whipped him. I put a move on him, just a quick, efficient release move on him, and I stacked his ass. Literally running down the field, stacked his ass. And Rodgers throws one of those beautiful rainbows up to me, and I clap onto that ball, and it just clangs off my palms, and I just want to die. You know, well, obviously you didn't microdose before this, and I did. So I'm going to quote the great American philosopher Aaron Rodgers. Relax. It's one <laughs> week. There were no offensive tackles. The big drop. Have, had he not dropped that pass, maybe the whole complexion of the game had changed if he had scored that touchdown. Uh, I'm old enough to remember this time last year when we were having this same conversation after the Saints thoroughly romped uh, uh, the the Packers and Aaron Rodgers had a horrible outing. Uh, I'm trying to remember how last season ended. Was it was it a 13-3 record and MVP for Aaron Rodgers? Relax, Matt. Nah, I love uh, listen. Devon, no Devonte Adams. I no fuck that. No fuck <laughs> that. Okay. I'm gonna just tell well, you stop it, young man. The slander's not allowed. Great quarterbacks make great receivers. Oh, we'll see about that. Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> Christian McCaffrey. Oh, I'm. I I can't do it. I'm. I I I I can't do it. Fuck it. No fuck it because. Baker Mayfield, I just don't I, – I don't see it. Cleveland plays safe. Cleveland plays safe football on defense. It's like don't put things behind us. That Now, Baker got behind him because of a busted coverage, but that's their MO is to play – is to basically give up stuff underneath. And I just – Baker's going to – I just think this is going to be tough. I don't uh, – I can't talk to myself. Two things. You can't it. fuck it. Two things. You can't fuck it because the sunk cost is already there. It's, you're going to keep I'm, playing them and you're going to hope they get it dialed I don't in wanna, and they will get it dialed I don't want to feel it. Talent. I don't want to feel it, but Christian McCaffrey's too fucking good. I tried to argue it, but I can't. How about you? Feel the yeah, talent. Same thing. Yeah. Feel the talent. Naheem Hines. I'm feeling that because if he can do what he did, even with Jonathan Taylor going off and getting the touches he did, Matt Ryan is going to be rolling with him. They've got designed plays for him that seem to work out very well. These quick hitting screens that they do where they don't make him as slow developing. Um, and he's working behind that line. They're using him as a receiver. <clears throat> the only thing that I can't fucking stand is that they're using him as a punt returner, which means that I might be feeling it for all of about six weeks <laughs> until he gets banged up. Okay, yeah. now we're in the O.J. Howard round. I already said I'm feeling that. You said you're fucking that. So I got – you got another one? Go ahead. Well, I want to just say, you know, if we're going to we're gonna go dive back to the Texans pool, um, feeling Rex Burkhead because he has a great haircut. Uh, fuck Damian Pierce. No, <clears throat> the rushing attack there, 
I warned everyone all week, the people, the enthusiasts for Damian Pierce, <clears throat> even granting he was going to get the workload. The Texans last year rushed what, 3.4 yards a carry, the yeah. worst in the league. Uh, their touchdowns were the lowest total of rushing touchdowns in like 20 years. Uh, they had no explosive plays. They were horrible. And Damian Pierce, I'm sorry, sir, you cannot play offensive line as well as running back. So good luck to you. Davis Mills, I love him, uh, but fuck this right now. I'm going to say, I, I just, I, I agree. And I'm just going to take this moment in time to say, I, if I were David Johnson right now, I'd say fuck the NFL because literally for the past two to three years, they put him in zone offenses and now everybody's running gap and he was the perfect gap back. I mean, this, if he's in San Francisco, if he were in San Francisco, it would, he would be a 15 to 1800 yard rusher. He was, he would have been that good in those types of systems. And he just got, he just got stuck in purgatory for, you know, too long. So maybe someone will try and bring him back this year. And certainly with Elijah Mitchell hurt, maybe that happens. Well, probably not. Cause they got enough backs in that, in that carousel. That's, you know, that Mike, that Kyle Shanahan has. Davis Mills, you already said that. I'm listen. I'm feeling it because they got to throw the ball. And right. I like Nico Tom. I like Nico Collins. I like Brandon Cooks. I'm I liked OJ Howard. Why? And from what I saw of Davis Mills, he's going to be a yardage collector. He'll at least right. get you one or two touchdowns. Right. No, nobody's nobody's counting on him as their quarterback one, and so that's fine as a yeah. backup in super flex or you know wherever you may have drafted him because you didn't have to pay for him. So I'm all for free pieces, and he was a free piece. Yeah. Uh, so is Greg Dorch. Feel it or fuck it. His mama's feeling it, man. She's like all over Twitter, follows everybody who does any type of film clips. So I'll say this. I, I would say I'm feeling it for as long as we know that, um, that, we know that Rondale Moore is going to be off. But as soon as Rondale Moore is ready, fuck it, because Greg Dortch just showed us what Rondale Moore is going to do in that offense. That I know without a shadow of a doubt. And they're doing a lot with that role. And that's the Rondale Moore role. Dontrell Hilliard. Oh, wait. You get a chance, too. I keep skipping you on some of these. Don't I, I just wonder if Andy Isabella's mom isn't going to start lobbying for something out there because uh, he's surely being left behind. Dontrell Hilliard, fuck it. It's not going to be sustainable, I don't think. Um, you know, it's hard to invest in a second back in an offense that has Derrick Henry. It wasn't, it wasn't Derrick Henry's best game, uh, but it's not his last game either. So uh, so, so don't get over uh, overhyped, folks. Yeah, I mean, I think Dontrell Hilliard is one of those, in a deep league, he could be a decent flex because the types of routes they're using him on, as Mark, I can't believe I'm saying this, but as Mark Sanchez said on a, on in his analysis, that the actual depth of the routes, the lines of the routes, the spacing with his routes are not the type of routes you often see a running back run. So the confidence that they had in him with the, some of the routes that they used were you know, are notable and certainly he's going to be at the top of your list. If Derrick Henry gets hurt, he might be a good matchup play for um, Tennessee. If they're, if they're the underdog massively and you think that they're not going to, they're going to be taken out of their run game. Be yeah, otherwise. Yeah. Fuck that. This is how it goes, folks. Uh, I'm going to cite great American philosophers like Aaron Rodgers. Matt's going to cite Mark Sanchez. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And you know what? I would say <laughs> this, like Saquon Barkley, We'll see who's right. <laughs> I wasn't right on that either. So we might be both wrong in that case, or we might be both right. Does that work we'll find that way? Out soon. That's yeah. how it works out. All right. Week two is right. coming, Matt. Love you. Goodbye. Yeah.